Good afternoon to you. Very happy to have this opportunity, everyone, um, to participate in this Hong Kong Forum, the 14th Hong Kong Forum. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you the Shanghai uh, Free Trade Zone and the development of it. I will be talking about a few areas. First of all, the economic background to the development of the free trade zone. And secondly, this is an experimental zone. What are the experiments in this experimental zone? Thirdly, how is it to work? What are the principles of its operation? And then we will be looking into the relationships between Hong Kong and the Shanghai Free Trade Zone and how do we benefit both. First of all, concerning the Shanghai Free Trade Zone um, development, it is the in the fourth round of major economic development of China. Before this, there were three big major waves of reform and opening. 35 years ago, and that was in 1978, China opened up four special economic zones, one of which I'm sure you'll hear it a lot, is the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone. And before 1978, overall economy of China was basically state-owned. And starting from 1978, there were privately owned enterprises and some of them with for foreign investments. And it was a fundamental change and reform in the economy of China. It was a major breakthrough for China. The next major development in China's economy was in 1990, and that was the Shanghai Pudong new area. It was opened up to overseas or foreign capital. And that was a huge change in the sense that there were joint stock companies, shareholdings for companies, and the listing of companies. That is to say, a capitalistic operation in China appeared. And the financial institutions of uh, in China included banks, new banks, and insurance companies. And then it also had its own stock market, its uh, bond market, its futures market, derivatives market, all developed after that so that the financial services could better serve the actual economy and industries of China, so that investment capital were channeled into production capital so as to further fuel the development of China. And the third wave of development was in the year 2000, and that was a time of China's extension into WTO. A lot of tariffs were done away with, a lot of limitations and hurdles for foreign capital entrance into China were cancelled and many international companies therefore established businesses in China and there was rapid development after that in China's economy. And the GDP at the time was 13% of the U.S. GDP. Last year, end of year last year, China's GDP is 52% of U.S.'s GDP. Over three <coughs> waves of economic development from its original 700 billion RMB to 52 trillion RMB uh, GDP and also the RMB, the RMB also appreciated. So it is more like uh, 8 trillion RMB if we take away the inflation uh, factor. So it is a very large, or the second largest economy around the world. And at the same time, there were a lot of problems that China met with. In the latest round of the plenary session of the Communist Party, there were 300 items which needed reform. So whatever needed reform had to be problems. 
So one would say there were a lot of problems, and they were in 15 major categories of issues. I will, of course, not go into the details, but suffice to say that there were a lot of problems. So what is the next phase of economic development for China? Of course, China will have to continue to develop. This is a most important theme for China, further development. So how is China to develop its e economy? And how does it solve the problems that it spotted? Through Shanghai, there will be a pilot scheme to address some of the issues. And this brings me to the Shanghai pilot scheme. For the government of China, there are three major targets. One, in 1982, it was raised that by the year 2000, China's GDP will have to grow uh, 200 percent from the base of uh, the 1980s so that the Chinese people will be full in the stomach and will have clothes on their back. That was a time when uh, GDP per capita was 500 RMB. It is now uh, 6,200 US dollars GDP per capita. So that was a very low base. That was the first target of, uh, at the time. And the second target was by the year 2000, China's GDP would have grown to an extent to exceed uh, $10,000 US. And the next uh, object, objective 20, by 2050, that it would have reached developed countries' levels. And that has been set out in the third plenary session of China. So that would be the so-called China dream as uh, promulgated by the chairman, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping. So what is the Shanghai pilot scheme, this Shanghai FTC free trade zone is to do? What is its mission? Why is it so important? Actually, there are three main objectives again. First of all, opening up the service industry. Within the service industry will be professional, social, cultural, and financial industries opening up the service industry. This is of utmost importance for China. At present, the economic structure of China is such that the primary industry is 10% of the GDP, but the labor is 38% of total. 38% of the total labor is producing 10% of the GDP. So you can see in the future, there will at least be 200 million laborers to be liberalized from this uh, sector. At present, there is overcapacity. And uh, what we produce in overcapacity, we are selling to overseas uh, markets already. So in the future, as labor is liberalized, uh, there will have to be the service industry to absorb the labor. It was 45% of the entire GDP for service industry last year. And every year going forward, service industry will increase by 1%. Now, that is the express target of the central government. So service industry in the future will be the main growth engine of GDP growth in China. And this is another uh, guarantee why urbanization will come to pass, because only through this will the extra labor from the rural development be absorbed. And a second point is that the service industry is still very different from the overseas industry. For service industry as a percentage of trade, it is still only 10 percent. And the global ratio, average speaking, service to total trade 
would be about 18 percent to 20 percent. So for China's service industry, it is really falling behind. It lags behind the actual trade. So in order to improve on the service industry so as to realize the goal of urbanization, the service industry will have to open up. And also, it will have to be reformed and open up internationally so as to fuel the further development and improvement of the service industry. So that is another mission of the free trade zone. And the third one is the negative list to improve the uh, government administration functions, to change from a state-owned economy into a market-oriented uh, economy, from a planned economy to a market-determined economy. So for the future, where there are unnecessary regulations and unnecessary approvals by the government, these will be done away with. So what is not uh, disapproved will be deemed as approved. By so doing, there will be higher efficiency and also a lowering of grafting opportunities and corruption opportunities. You would also have noticed, perhaps, that for the first list of the negative list, there are 190 of them. And of the 1,060 total items in the negative list, it is 17.8%. This is the 2013 version. As we come to 2014, 2015, there will be an upgrading of the version. That is to say, the so-called negative list will be contracted. That would include industrial, service, and agricultural sectors. And therein are uh, security issues concerning the finance and economy of China. Those will be kept. And for culture, and other aspects, they will be liberalized. For anything that stands in the way of economic efficient development in terms of approvals and uh, bureaucracy will be done away with. So through this negative list management to improve the market mechanisms operation in China. And another area is to facilitate global trade and investment. China is to be internationalized. It is to follow the international standards upon the accession to WTO. It's been full force ahead in being globalized. However, for some of the WTO uh, rules and regulations, they have been marginalized. For instance, for service industry opening up recently, it is already in a very cooperative uh, mode. But at the same time, we observe that the developed countries are stepping up their cooperation with within their regions with their friendly nations, whether it is TTP, P TPIP, and TSA, all these. They are forming these uh, cooperations within their groups. And China, as the second largest economy around the world, as the major exporter in the world, will also become a capital exporting country in the future. We also will be opening up new cooperative opportunities. We will be opening up new market, markets so as to uh, extend our reach. 
So there will be facilitation of global investment and trade so as to promote the development of its economy. So these are the three major missions of the Shanghai FTZ. As for the operation model of the free trade zone, yesterday, the PBOC, that is a peop the Central Bank of China, had uh, made public a set of opinions concerning the operation of the Shanghai FTC. And basically, there are three main points. One, that this FTZ will open to the outside world. Within the FTZ, it is free, liberal. And the FTZ towards the mainland, that is, other areas in China, uh, it is not uh, completely free in the sense that it is regulated. So those are the three themes. For this free trade zone and those living inside the free trade zone, there are two categories. One, the mainland residents and companies. The second category are overseas persons and companies that would include Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwanese as well. So there are these two types and they will be dealt with differently. For the enterprises within the FTZ, they can remit, invest, settle, and deal in forex. They can lend, borrow, guarantee as well. And within the FTZ, they can also freely conduct these activities. But if they want to go into the mainland other than the FTZ, the residents, the China residents can do so. For investments into the mainland, uh, they can invest in industries, they can conduct in trade, but for capital accounts opening, that will be restricted. So for the FTZ, it is free if it faces the outside world. For the FTC facing the mainland, the rest of the mainland of China, it is restricted. So that is the mode of operation. As for goods, for goods coming from outside of China into the FTZ, it is in the bonded area. And that falls into the overseas category. But for the goods to go into the mainland, they will be subject to tariffs. The setup of the Shanghai FTZ and its relationship and impact on Hong Kong. Some people worry that the Shanghai Free Trade Zone will become another Hong Kong or take the place of Hong Kong. I personally feel that that will not be the case. And the central government has no intention to take away the position of Hong Kong. And Hong Kong's position cannot be done away with. Shanghai Free Trade Zone in the next two to three years will be copied in other areas of China. If the FTZs become Hong Kong, first of all, this will present uh, financial uh, problems. And at the same time, in fact, it would not be replicated in any short time in other places in China. But there are certain areas such as uh, offshore finance, transport and logistics industry, entrepot trade, there may be certain impact to Hong Kong. But it also opens up certain opportunities for Hong Kong, such as, one, for mainland market opening. China's market opening up, especially in the area of service industry 
and 93% of the GDP is from the service industry, that is Hong Kong. This is a very important policy. As you know, there is a SEPA between Hong Kong and the mainland. These policies are um, implemented through the positive list. And in the future, when Hong Kong discusses SEPA with uh, China, it will no longer be on the positive list basis, but on a negative list basis. So between the mainland and Hong Kong, the mainland will become an even bigger market for Hong Kong. So there will be more opportunities for investment and for business. A second point, the economy of China will continue to grow rapidly. Fang Fang has already said, it, said that the GDP will grow by about 7.5% year on year. So this pie will become larger and larger. As a pie gets larger, China, as a large GDP country, becomes a large GDP per capita country. And the wealth will be accumulated among the people. And this wealth needs to be invested. It needs to be managed. It, it will become a consumer country. There will have to be more consumption of domestic as well as overseas or foreign goods. Thirdly, it will become a capital exporting country, China. And of course, it is also a manufacturing uh, country, major country as well. It will not be a situation where the industrial and manufacturing sector would contract to a very small percentage of GDP because of its huge population, 1.3 billion. It's impossible for there to be very little manufacturing. So the economy of China is growing in all aspects. And perhaps the emphasis on Hong Kong, reliance on Hong Kong, may be smaller in certain aspects. But on the other hand, the total uh, benefit would still be bigger. And also a third point, as the capital market opens up in the mainland, there will be more financial developments. In 2003, after 911, and after the tech bubble burst, together with SARS occurrence in, China, uh, in Hong Kong, there was a time of real doldrums in the economy in, in Hong Kong. And with the um, uh, individual uh, free tours coming to Hong Kong, that is individuals can, indiv uh, can on themselves come to Hong Kong to shop and to uh, visit with that. Uh, some 40 million visitors to Hong Kong last year in terms of tourists, 30 million were from the mainland. That really gave Hong Kong an injection of energy into its economy. More companies will be using Hong Kong, mainland companies will be uh, using Hong Kong as a platform to go outside of um, China in terms of uh, company set up in terms of capital parking in Hong Kong before going out, these will be opportunities for Hong Kong. And Ch Hong Kong has its very uh, outstanding uh, strengths. One, its legal system. The contractual honoring practice is very sound and this uh, much sounder than the rest of China. There is this spirit of honoring the contract. Everything goes according to the laws. This is something the mainland has to uh, learn. The second point, information transparency. In Hong Kong, there is no filtering of information, especially for a financial center this is very important. Information has to be conveyed by the second. 
So this is another area where Hong Kong is leads mainland. Thirdly, professional management. All these allow Hong Kong to continue to be a major window to the international world and a, an inter, international financial center. In the next two to three years, the Shanghai FTZ will be generalized to the other areas of China. That is to say, there will be another free trade zone in the next two to three years, probably in Guangdong or around the Guangdong area. Probably Guangdong plus Hong Kong and Macau adjacent areas. If there is such a free trade zone, then for Hong Kong in many areas, Hong Kong will become integrated with the mainland. And the advantages that we have spoken of just now, for example, the low tax rates, the open openness, the talents, of Hong Kong can be the major pillars supporting the Pearl River Delta region's development. For Pearl River Delta region, if we're talking about the Pan Pearl River Delta region, it is about one-fifth of the territory of uh, China, one-third of the population of China, and one-third of the economy of China. So if Hong Kong is to play a leadership role in the Pan Po River Delta region of China, then it will have a major role to play. If we look at the past 35 years and its reform and opening up, in the first phase of its opening up, and that is the opening up of Shenzhen, a lot of Hong Kong companies went into China, and Hong Kong also transformed itself economically. As Shanghai reforms and opens up, that is at the point of establishing shareholding companies, China became the listing venue of the eight shares and red chips. Upon China's accession, accession to WTO, Hong Kong's entrepot trade increased significantly. As the RMB internationalizes, China becomes an offshore center for RMB. And as China's economy goes outside of the country, Hong Kong will be the professional projects as well as financing platform. So last year, the Chinese economy reached out. It's almost 90 billion US dollars. And within this amount, 60% was invested in Hong Kong through or through Hong Kong to other parts of the world. So Hong Kong is a very important platform for China's economy to reach out. And in relation to foreign investment into the mainland, 60% of these investments were through Hong Kong. So here we have two 60%. So we can see that in the open reform and economic development of China, Hong Kong really plays an important role. And in the future, this role will continue. In the future, Hong Kong will still remain an important financing, wealth management, RMB transaction center. When I refer to RMB, Hong Kong is not only an offshore center, it is also a transaction center or trading center. So securities, bonds, foreign exchange, metals, and so on, insurance, all these will be well developed here. Hong Kong is a trading center for intangible assets in intellectual property. Recently, TDC organized an intellectual property exhibition. And in mainland China, uh, well, they already possess a lot of intellectual property, even though rule of law is still not very strong. I have uh, read a figure. Every year, mainland China 
applies for a number of patents, accounting for 17% of the total number of patents globally. And if you talk about the uh, uh, commercial brands, uh, the total number accounts for 28% of the total number of uh, brands being developed. So Hong Kong can play a very important role again in this area because of our legal system, our professional talents, and transparency of information. And Hong Kong can continue to be a logistics center. Uh, after the completion of the cruise terminal, there will be a lot of tourism-related developments which will capitalize on a cruise terminal. There will be the opportunity to become the Pan PRD region commercial and financial center. So in the past 35 years of reform and opening, well, China has been making her steps uh, gradually. And in the future, um, it will continue to um, rely on trial and error. At the same time, they will uh, be actively developing the right model of economic development. In the future, of course, to China, development is still most important. We want to um, cross over the uh, limitation of middle income. This is said very clearly in the third plenary. And on one hand, uh, Hong Kong can play a very important role in China's economic development. At the same time, we can share the benefits from economic growth in China. That's all in my presentation. So uh, I'm happy to take your questions and have further exchanges. Thank you.